Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, today we are going to learn about shock. Now this topic is part of the broader chapter Hemodynamic Disturbances. In these series, we look at disturbances in the circulation, be it at the level of the heart, in the arteries, arterioles, microcirculation, venules or veins. Under this chapter, we have seen a couple of other topics like edema, hemorrhage, infarction, gangrene, embolism. Today we will focus our attention on studying the features of shock. Now, By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define shock, explain the pathogenesis and list the types of shock. One additional feature we will be looking at is trying to understand the pathogenesis with reference to each type of shock. Let us go back to the basics for a short while. Now we know that there is a lot of activity metabolic biochemical occurring at the level of the cell. Here for all those activities energy is generated by the metabolism of carbohydrates especially glucose which is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. This carbon dioxide and water along with other metabolites that are formed within the cell are drained into the venules and carried back through the venous circulation to the heart, lungs and so on. Now for all these metabolic activities at the cellular level oxygen is required. This oxygen is brought to the cells and the tissues by the blood vessels and this flow of blood supplying oxygen and nutrients to the tissue is referred to as tissue perfusion. This tissue perfusion is determined by the blood flow to a given tissue or organ. Now if this oxygen supply is not there, the initial aerobic metabolism which we mentioned will transform into an aerobic metabolism wherein carbohydrates are converted to lactic acid. This results in acidosis with the drop in the pH at the cellular level cell injury results. Now in shock what happens is that there is complete cardiovascular collapse meaning blood supply to each and every organ and tissue is affected. So therefore there will be a state of profound hemodynamic and metabolic disturbances that are characterized by failure to maintain adequate blood supply to the microcirculation. This causes generalized hypoperfusion of the organs. So what happens then? We talked about the blood flow ensuring blood uh, tissue perfusion that ensures oxygen is supplied for glycolysis. If that is not there, lactic acidosis results and cell injury occurs. Now in a normal person, there are several compensatory mechanisms which will try to negate these detrimental effects. These mechanisms include an increase in the heart rate of the patient, an increase in the contractility of the heart allowing more blood to be pushed out into the circulation, peripheral vasoconstriction so that the blood is redistributed to vital organs, 
The renin angiotensin mechanism is brought into play which ensures sodium and water retention thereby increasing the fluid component in the vascular compartment. Similarly, the action of antidiuretic hormone causing sodium and water retention. If however, the condition that is causing the hypoperfusion of tissue continues, then the acidosis becomes progressive. The cells which were initially reversibly injured become irreversibly injured until finally there is cell death. So, let us recap the definition of shock. Here there is complete cardiovascular collapse, it is generalized, it is diffuse, wherein there is profound hemodynamic and metabolic disturbances that are characterized by a failure to maintain blood flow in the microcirculation resulting in generalized hypoperfusion of organs. Therefore, there is going to be involvement of a large number of organs, tissues and cell and with these organs being affected, it will result in multi organ failure and finally, be fatal to that patient. Now, let us go on to study a little bit more about the pathogenesis of shock. We talked about blood flow being important to ensure tissue perfusion and oxygen supply. What is important to maintain this blood flow? It is the arterial blood pressure which determines the blood flow to the tissue. Now, this arterial blood pressure in turn is dependent on two factors. One is the cardiac output, the other is the total peripheral resistance. The cardiac output in turn depends upon two factors, the heart rate and the stroke volume. The heart rate is balanced by the parasympathetic and sympathetic factors. The stroke volume depends on venous return and that in turn depends on the blood volume that is circulating as well as the respiratory pump which causes a negative pressure ensuring venous return to the heart as well as the skeletal pump which squeezes the veins at the periphery ensuring that the venous return is pushed towards the heart. There is another small factor acting in the pathogenesis of shock. Whenever anaerobic glycolysis occurs and acidosis results, we find that there is a blunting of vasomotor responses and therefore, this will result in blood pooling in the peripheral circulation. This in turn will decrease the venous return to the heart and therefore, reduce the cardiac output and that is going to again cause decreased tissue perfusion and decreased oxygen supply to the cells. In essence, these are the various mechanisms that come together in shock which ultimately results in multiple organ failure and death of the patient. Now, let us go back and look at the different kinds of shock. There are basically five main types, cardiogenic shock which occurs when there are different cardiac diseases, we will list that in a moment, hypovolemic shock when there is loss of blood volume, septic shock when there is bacteremia, neurogenic shock when there is loss of vascular tone and peripheral pooling of the blood, anaphylactic shock as occurs in hypersensitivity and is IgE mediated. We will focus on the pathogenic mechanism involved in the first three types of shock that is cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock and septic shock. Before we go to the mechanism exactly, let us look at a few diseases that are cardiogenic that result in shock. Basically, the problem that results in these diseases is that there will be low cardiac output and that low cardiac output will in turn reduce the blood pressure, will reduce the oxygen perfusion at the tissue level. A common disease is myocardial infarction. Here, because of ischemia to the myocardium, its function is affected the heart does not become an effective pump and therefore, the cardiac output is reduced. 
arrhythmias where the rhythm is affected like for example in atrial fibrillation also affects the cardiac output. If in a myocardial infarction patient the softened myocardium ruptures then blood escapes into the pericardial cavity and in turn affects the contractility of the heart. So that would in turn affect the cardiac output. Similarly, cardiac tamponade where there is fibrosis of the pericardium inhibiting the contractility of the heart. Any cause for outflow obstruction, for example, if a patient has a pulmonary embolus, this embolus can move into the pulmonary trunk and block the outflow from the right side of the heart and then decrease the flow of blood into the left side and therefore cause low cardiac output. So the causes for cardiogenic shock include myocardial infarction, arrhythmias, ventricular rupture, cardiac tamponade and massive pulmonary embolus. So how and where at the level of the pathogenic cascade do these act? Myocardial infarction affects the cardiac output which will affect the arterial pressure, which will affect the blood flow and therefore cause hypoperfusion of the tissue with decreased oxygen supply to the tissues. Arrhythmias would alter the heart rate. So a decreased heart rate will again decrease the cardiac output and the same mechanism thereafter. Cardiac tamponade and pulmonary embolism would affect the stroke volume that is the amount of blood that is being pumped out of the heart at every stroke. The second type of shock is hypovolemic shock. Here again the main mechanism is low cardiac output. Now when does this occur? If a patient has massive hemorrhage, for example a patient with a road traffic accident who has had serious injuries causing massive loss of blood. Patients who have had extensive burns where a lot of the fluid oozes out from the surface of the damaged skin resulting in hypovolemia. Patients who have had severe vomiting and diarrhea due to any cause. All these patients will have a net decrease in the intravascular fluid volume and therefore will have low cardiac output because the stroke volume will come down and therefore the cardiac output drops and therefore arterial pressure drops and so on with the pathogenic mechanism. The third and a very important type of shock is a septic shock. This is associated with a very high mortality. It is usually seen in patients who have overwhelming infection and it is quite common in patients who are debilitated hospitalized for a long period of time or who are immunocompromised. The mechanism is because of the toxins that are released by the infective agents. Both gram positive and gram negative bacteria can cause septic shock. Sometimes fungal infections also cause septic shock. Now in septic shock as compared to the other two types which we have mentioned the mechanism is slightly different from what we saw in those cases. In these conditions because of the bacterial infection there is setting up of a diffuse inflammatory response. This inflammatory response as you already have learnt in the inflammation chapter one of the important vascular events is vasodilatation. In inflammation that is localized, it is okay for vessels to dilate locally because that allows the exudate to form which will combat the bacterial agent. Whereas here in septic shock, the bacteria are dividing and proliferating and in the circulation being distributed throughout the body. So imagine if such an inflammatory response is set up throughout the body. There will be increased vasodilatation of vessels throughout the body as well as increased vascular permeability. Because vessels dilate throughout the body, there will be a drop in the peripheral vascular resistance and that in turn is going to cause decreased blood pressure and decreased tissue perfusion. Now the comparison between the two types we saw earlier and septic shock 
In the earlier, we said compensatory mechanisms will cause peripheral vasoconstriction, thereby redistributing blood to the vital organs. So, if you touch a person who is having either a cardiogenic shock or a hypovolemic shock, you find that their skin is cold and clammy. However, in septic shock, there is vasodilatation. So, therefore, when you touch these patients, you find that the skin is warm and dry and that is because of that peripheral vasodilatation. In septic shock, it is a number of different mechanisms which are called into play and a number of different pathological processes occur besides the changes we have just described in the vasculature. There is a setting up of coagulation in the vessels and usually this occurs in the microcirculation level. So, the patients develop what is called as a disseminated intravascular coagulation. Complement cascade is activated and this results in the various inflammatory actions that you have already learnt in the inflammation chapter. It activates the endothelium, it induces vasodilatation and it increases the vascular permeability. Recruited WBCs like the neutrophils and the monocytes also secrete a variety of cytokines and uh, cytokine like mediators and these in turn set up the systemic effects like they cause pyrexia and also they cause immunosuppression and therefore, the patient is una unable to combat the bacteria that are circulating. All in all, these microthrombi, the vasodilatation, the drop in the cardiac output, drop in the blood pressure and tissue perfusion results in cell injury at the tissue level and ultimately multiple organs begin to fail and that causes death of the patient in septic shock. It is also called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So, you will see now that when a patient is developing shock, initially there are compensatory mechanisms coming into play and therefore, it does not progress at that point. If the condition is recognized, the patient is treated and the causative factor is dealt with, probably that patient will survive. However, if the causative factor continues and the cell injury persists because of progressive acidosis, then there is a stage of reversible cell injury and further acidosis and hypoxia will result in cell death in a variety of organs and at that point the process is irreversible and invariably fatal to that patient. We have now learnt the definition of shock, we have understood the basic pathogenic mechanisms, we have learnt that there are five types of shock and correlated the mechanism in each one of these types. We saw that shock implies complete cardiovascular collapse, a state of profound hemodynamic and metabolic disturbances resulting in or characterized by failure to maintain adequate blood supply at the microcirculation. This results in hypoperfusion of the organs, hypoxia, cell injury and cell death. The cardiovascular co collapse is mainly due to two mechanisms, a decreased cardiac output or a reduction in the circulating blood volume and that is in turn is causing the systemic hypoperfusion. We need to remember that shock is the final common pathway for several potentially lethal clinical events and we saw that in each of the types of shock and their causative diseases. We have now completed one more hemodynamic disorder that is shock which implies circulatory collapse. Thank you.